Well, it's good to see each of you here this morning. Look forward to our time of worship together. Bob is coming to read for us this morning. Good morning. We're reading uh, Psalm 45, please. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured unto thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and with thy, and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia, out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. The king's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophar. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people <coughs> and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy lord, and worship thou him. And the daughter of Tyre shall be with the, with the gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is broad gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions, that follow her shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy fathers, it shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. We pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to read your word, dear Lord, that you would open our hearts, call us to you, dear Lord, to see Christ in Christ alone. In all the words that are written. In Jesus' name, amen. Precious small. Let's take our bulletins and the inside cover and we'll sing this hymn to the tune of There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from the man. <laughs> Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth. 
but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and has prospered, which removeth the mountains, and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger, which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble, which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. Behold, he taketh away, who can hinder him? Who will say unto him, What doeth thou? If God will not withdraw his anger, the proud heifers do speak under him. How much less shall I answer him and choose out my words to reason with him? Whom though I were righteous, yet would I not answer, but I would make supplication to my judge. If I had called and he had answered me, yet would I not believe that he had hearkened unto my voice? For he breaketh me with the tempest and multiplieth my wounds without cause. He will not suffer me to take my breath, but filleth me with bitterness. If I speak of strength, lo, he is strong. And by of judgment, who shall set me a time to flee? <clears throat> if I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul. I would despise my life. This is one thing. Therefore I said it, he destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. If the scourge slay suddenly, he will laugh at the trial of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? Now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away, they see no good. They are passed away as the swift ships, as the eagle that hasten to the prey. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will leave all my heaviness and comfort myself. I am afraid of my sorrows. I know that thou wilt not hold me innocent. If I be wicked, why then labor I in vain? If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet shall they if thou plunge me in the ditch and my own clothes shall afford me. For he is not a man as I am, that I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman of the twitch that might lay his hand upon us. Let him take his rod away from me, and let not his fear terrify me. Then I sh would I speak, and not fear him, but it is not so with me. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you, and we praise you. Lord, None of us can justify ourselves before God. It is only Christ who is the great justifier. Lord, we ask you to forgive us our sins. Be with Brother Ken today as he delivers the word. Open our hearts to take that word into our heart. Lord, we pray for all the people here today and those that are listening by other means. We ask all things in Christ's name. We pray. All right, before the message, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 35. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. Hymn number 35. We'll stand and sing this together. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, to his feet and tribute bring. Ransom he'll be star forgiven, evermore his praises sing. Alleluia, praise the everlasting King. Alleluia, praise the everlasting King. Father like he tends and spares us. God, people, thank 
text is from Exodus 7, 14, all the way to chapter 12 and verse 36. And I know there's already doubters in our midst, myself included, as to how you deal with a passage such as this. So we're going to jump in, begin to swim, as the Lord directs, get as far as the Lord directs. But the reason it is such a text is because these are the scriptures Exodus 7, 14, all the way to chapter 12 and verse 36, that I've entitled a holy war. There is nothing more foolish than for men to think themselves wiser than God and to pretend that somehow they can worship God however they please and that God would treat it lightly. That's one thing in human nations to take on other nations that are powerful and you can read histories of wars that in many cases any that attempted such a thing they were destroyed. But I'll tell you ever since the fall of Adam there's been a war and God described it that way. He told Adam and Eve that he would put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And that ultimately, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. The seed of the serpent would bruise the seed of the woman's heel. That's a picture of battle. And all the way through scripture, we find this is an ongoing battle. But it's a battle that man can never win. And that it all culminated in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death there at Calvary. Put away the sin, the enmity, to reconcile to himself those sinners that God had purposed to save. So all the way through the Old Testament, we see types and pictures of this battle. And yet, in the end, it is God that gets the glory. So that's why I've entitled this Holy War. Because... God is holy. God is just. He will not in any way acquit the guilty. But at the same time, we know that because he's a holy God, he cannot save except for in a just and holy way as well. And that's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we read through these ten plagues, I remember growing up and reading about these plagues, but never really fully, not fully understanding what was behind them. We're going to find that through these plagues, in reality, what God is doing is pronouncing judgment on these gods of Egypt. Because God had delivered up Israel for over 400 years unto the bondage here in Egypt. And now when God purposed to deliver, he's going to show that they weren't under the bondage of Egypt because God was not as powerful as their gods, although they thought so. They questioned Moses as to who is this God, and so the battle raged in a holy war, because this is a war that has to do with God's justice and honor. And the story ends, as we all know, with that final plague, that of taking the firstborn son. 
any doorpost that did not have the blood on that doorpost, that firstborn of that household was slain. And so, if anybody wonders whether God means business with regard to his holiness and his justice, wonder no more. You do not want to face a holy God without a mediator. If these Egyptians were alive today and were to stand here and testify, they would say, we didn't even see what was coming. And such are men in their blindness. I say the same thing today. You've got people running all over this world thinking that somehow they've got a relationship with God. They have a relationship with a God. It's the one of their making. But how few know the true God who exercises his will and justice, where, when, and how he will. And does it through the hand of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's begin here reading in Exodus chapter 7, verse 14. God's accomplishing his purpose here, showing himself to be God over any gods that men might have. And it begins here in Exodus chapter 7, verse 14. The Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. As we're going to see, it's God that was hardening his heart. Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning, lo, he goeth out unto the water. How many take for granted water? And thou shalt stand by the river's bank, or brink against he come, and the rod which was turned into a serpent shalt thou take in thine hand, and thou shalt say unto him, Notice here, here's the confrontation. The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldst not hear. Again, this is not God complaining. He's just declaring what's in the heart of man. None would hear, except for God grant repentance. Thus saith the Lord. Notice how many times down through. Lord, capital L-O-R-D. Jehovah God, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Realize there were over 60 different gods that the Egyptians considered to be gods. Here we're only dealing with 10 of them. Perhaps the top 10 that the Egyptians worshipped. But there are many gods in the world today as are men's hearts because we're born for idolatry. He says that thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand. Again, Moses represents Christ here. He's the mediator. God has put all power into his hand, exercised his will over men and nations, over creation, all things. That rod represents his authority. I will smite with the rod that is in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. Representation of death, blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. There's one water which is ever pure, and that's the water of the life. That, that's life to those for whom God has purposed it. But any other cisterns hewn, drawn out by men, the Lord is going to prove to be for man's death. The Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood. Anything that man values by way of life now is going to be death. And that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt. This is difficult for us to fathom. Wherever you found a source of water, death, 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 both in the vessels of wood, vessels of stone, even what you've gathered in your household. But lift that lid and take a drink, death. Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. He lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river, the side of Pharaoh and in the side of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river returned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank. You can imagine stench of death even the stench of blood people talk about it in warfare this horrible stench of death 
river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river. And there was blood throughout all the land. The magicians did so with their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. This shows here again, repentance will never come from affliction. It only comes by the Spirit of God. His heart was hardened. I mentioned to you about the cries of souls from hell. It isn't in repentance. It says that they gnash their teeth. They're gnashing their teeth against the Holy God. This is the Holy War, such as the rebellion of the heart. Neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house. Neither did he set his heart to do this also. How depraved is the heart? That even in the face of death, man will not repent. And all the Egyptians digged round about the river for the water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. See, man will always look for another way around. That's what we're saying here. Dig out, dig out, let's dig out our own cisterns rather than the turn to him who is the water of life. And seven days were fulfilled after that the Lord had smitten the river. We all get upset here when they put out a boil notice and something's wrong with the water. You know, you're going to have to boil water for three days and everybody's all like, you know, this is not right. Such is the nature. Here's seven days. Seven days. I have to tell you again that each of these gods, and there's a study out there, you can go look at it yourself. Each of these, like the water turning to blood, <coughs> that is the Egyptian plague. The Lord is specifically targeting one of their gods. People say all the time, what kind of God would do this? Well, a just and holy God. And if the God you trust is not the God of Scripture, if it's not coming to him in by through the Lord Jesus Christ, you will find that there is no hope. This particular God they, they call Happy, probably pronounced Hoppy, H-A-P-I, but that was the Egyptian God of the Nile. This, in the pictures that they show of this Egyptian God, he's the water bearer. And it's interesting that people consider gods to be their servants. That's how men in their depravity even perceive the sovereign God. He's there for us. And so if we just live right and do right, then he's going he's gonna to take care of us. He's going to bring us what we want. This was their notion. And so this God, in particular, the very first one attacked perhaps was the one in whom they trusted, because they considered that Nile River to be sacred. Just like if you go over to India, the Ganges River. So many people have gone there today to plunge themselves in it, they wash their clothes in it, they do everything in it, and it is such a polluted river that you can't get the stenches of bomb, and yet people still continue to go back to it. So the Lord said, you want stench? Your stench will turn into blood. So that's the first we see here. And the Lord spake unto Moses, go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Again, I don't want you to think this is God begging. God in his providence and his sovereignty has a time for everything. It just, it may appear sometimes that the, uh, Evil has the upper hand on him, but it's God directing all the while. Just because he doesn't immediately execute his judgment. So this is a command. It's just like the gospel command. It's, it's not an invitation. Here he's saying, thus said the Lord, let, thy, let my people go. Who did he have in mind for all this? His people. That they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, Here's the second. I will smite all thy borders with frogs. That was another Egyptian, actually goddess. I find it interesting today. They're trying to neutralize God and say, well, he's not a he. And uh, he may be a she. And so he, she. Well, that's nothing new. You go all the way back into Egypt. Here, the god of the frogs was actually a goddess. This was the goddess of fertility and of water and renewal. Frogs coming up out of the Nile River. They considered this to be a goddess. But the Lord says, what? I will smite all thy borders with frogs. He's not just randomly picking elements here to 
denounced. These were parts of creation that men worshipped. The Lord's proving himself to be even above them. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house and into thy bedchamber and upon thy bed and into the house of thy servants and upon thy people and into thine ovens. Imagine going to bake bread and there's the frogs croaking away. And into thy kneading troughs. Who likes the thought of making bread and having to deal with frogs that are in there? Just appearing everywhere. And the frogs shall come up both on thee and upon thy people and upon all thy servants. You want to worship a false god? Okay, I'll give it to you in abundance. Here it is. Have at it. This particular goddess was called Hecate. H-E-K-E-T, if you want to keep track. They, they worshipped. This was an Egyptian goddess of fertility that they worshipped. Talk about fertility. I know we talk about rabbits reproducing. Here's frogs reproducing. And it's the Lord directed. The Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Now here's where we see down through here, sometimes the magicians, the Lord purpose, they should answer. You say, why would he do that? Well, to cause them to continue in their hardness to trust their gods. You have that today where people will talk about having been healed. And they went over here and heard this preacher and, and their life was blessed. And they went down to the boats and won the lottery and all this. And that, and you're thinking, well, is God in or not? He was in it for their condemnation. So even here, the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. And I find it interesting that God did not ordain they stay the frogs. Why do we need more frogs? They went out there and stirred up more frogs for the condemnation of the people. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. Here we see Pharaoh as a picture of compromise. Like so many today, when the heat's turned up, they begin to ask the Lord to be entreated that they might be delivered from the affliction. They're not really interested in worshiping the Lord themselves or knowing of Him. They negotiate with God. You've heard it. Get me up off this deathbed or get me off this sickness bed. Work this out, Lord, and I'll serve. <laughs> Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee, and thy houses that they may remain in the river only and he said tomorrow now if you say well why is Moses even asking of Pharaoh the time that this should take place it's again to prove that God is sovereign not only over the elements of this earth the creatures of this earth but the time it was very important here that he see the hand of God even through Moses, that nothing moves or takes its place but what comes through him. We know that to be true of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it's in salvation or condemnation. It is through this Lord Jesus Christ that all things take place. It will be according to his will and his time. And he said, tomorrow, that's what Pharaoh said. I find it interesting. He didn't say immediately. Even that the Lord directed. Want one more day? Okay, give me one day. It'll be tomorrow. And he said, Be it according to thy word that thou mayest, here it is again, and know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee, and from thy houses, and from thy servants, and from the people, and they shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh. See, some people. When they see that, they think, oh, good, he's going to get some relief. I'll tell you, there's nothing good when it says in Scripture, even with, as with the Lord Jesus Christ, he went out from the people. There's nothing worse than being left to your idolatry and your condemnation, even though any apparent judgment might be removed. This is a judgment. 
And it says, Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh. Left still in his unbelief and rebellion. Hardness. And Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And all this we see a picture of Christ. Everything that Christ did was for the glory of his father. Everything the father did was for the glory of his son. It says there in the New Testament that the father here the son. And so Moses is not requesting anything other than that the Father be glorified, God be glorified. And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. Now, you think, well, that's a relief. No, what happens with dead frogs? They gathered them together with upon heaps, and the land sank. The Lord's going to get the glory. And when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, did it say he repented? No. He hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Temporary relief is not an indication of God's blessing, but rather hearts being hardened. I'm sure that as time went on, Pharaoh is thinking, these gods that this God is attacking are doing us no good, but they, they couldn't give them up. Like men today, you can bring temptation and affliction and all things the Lord brings, but it doesn't bring repentance. It's only the Spirit of God that grants that. So the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now imagine every particle of dust actually becoming lice. We worry about it when you see it on a dog or someone in their hair. It's just, it's not, we're talking about the dust of the earth becoming lice. This particularly was an attack against their Egyptian god. This would be a male god called Jeb. G-E-B. And Jeb was over the dust of the earth. The people today still think that, well, there's a god of the rain, there's a god of the sky, there's a God of the earth, there's a God of the water, there's a God. It doesn't matter, there's one Lord overall. And to show his power again, even turning this lice from dust into lice, that again is the finger of God. Here it says, and they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod, verse 17, and smote the dust of the earth and became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, the smallest of little creatures like gnats. And yet in them, their life depends upon the sovereign God. Just as he took man and formed him out of the dust of the earth, here he's taking dust and forming lice. That power is with God alone. This doesn't just happen. This is not evolution. It says the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. See, there are limits to, to man where God determines. Thus far, no further. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is what? The finger of God. Men can acknowledge certain things beyond their power, rather, even though they don't bow to that God, that they acknowledge that this must be of God. But what does that do to man's heart? It says Pharaoh's heart was hardened, all the more. And he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Notice, as the Lord had said. There's not a person that's going to repent, but what God declares that repentance and grants it to them. Otherwise, they'll die as they've lived hardened, the fist raised against the holy God. That's why it's a holy war. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And you can imagine this. Pharaoh comes to the water. Remember the last time he went to the water. Here's Moses. Oh no. But none of that moved him. Verse 21, else if thou wilt not let my people go. The message doesn't change. Behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee and upon thy servants and upon thy people. 
and into thy houses, and then the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground whereon they are. This past week I went to eat with a couple of acquaintances, and it was a reasonably nice restaurant, and sat down, and they had all the chinaware and dinner and glasses and everything, and table, and here's this little pesky flies. flies. We're all swatting at it, think, come on, this is supposed to be a nice restaurant. That's one fly. Imagine here the swarms of flies. And the Lord said, it shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground whereon they are. So these aren't just flies flying around. Everywhere you took a step, you were crushing. Who is this God? Well, they were trusting in a God called Kepri. This was their God of creation. And the one that supposedly moved the sun. And interestingly enough, as I looked at the picture, all these have pictures. You can go look at this out there, these, these Egyptian gods. Because they're man-made. They're made of man's thinking, making. But he actually has a head of a fly. Imagine worshiping such a god. Does any wonder why the Lord, I mean, this is the heart and belief of these. That such would trust in these gods of their making. And he said, verse 22, I will sever in that day the land of Goshen. Goshen is Egypt, in which my people dwell. This is amazing, that no swarms of flies shall be there. These plagues, many times you think, well, what about the Lord's people that were there? They were protected. He did not cause to fall on them the plagues that he brought upon Egypt. I'll tell you, that's for Christ's sake alone. Christ the mediator. To the end, thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. If you wonder what it is that the Lord is proving here, that is repeated over and over again. And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. I know that in the flesh, in this life, we endure many of the, the sufferings that come upon the world, but not the way the world suffers. The Lord says, I have put a division between my people and my people. How's that been put? In his electing grace and in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation accomplished for them as opposed to the rest of the world. Same God overall, but salvation for his people, deliverance for his people, and condemnation for the rest. And the Lord did so. I love that simple statement. The Lord did so. And there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarms of flies. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. Here's a little bit of a stirring. But nonetheless, it's not a work of grace. He didn't call them to say, teach me of your God that we may worship him and renounce all these other gods in whom we trust. He said, get out, go ye serve, sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, it is not meet so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. That's what we're sacrificing right here. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. If we're going to do it, it's going to be according to God's terms, and it's going to be a separate sacrifice than can be found here in Egypt. You see, Pharaoh is a picture of compromise. You go worship your God, we'll worship ours, and let's all get along. That's not how the Lord directs his people. There's a coming out of being separate. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only ye shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people tomorrow, but let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully 
anymore in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses. There are times when the Lord brings temporal relief. People complain about storms and hurricanes and wars and famines and all these things, and yet there are times that God purposes relief even for the reprobates. That was the case here. And so Moses went out and entreated the Lord, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. That's an amazing thing right there. How many times have you sprayed and cleaned up flies? I was spraying the other day, and I thought we got them all, swept them up, and throw them in the trash, and then I opened the refrigerator, and lo and behold, here was a dead fly in the refrigerator. It says there remained not one. How thorough is God in his judgments, but how thorough is he also in his deliverance? Yet for all of that, they repented not. It says in verse 32, and Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. It's because we see a softening in sinners outwardly and a relief. We'll even have some kind of speak that word once they're out from under a particular trial and say, oh, thank God. That's no sign of repentance. What God are you thanking? It's typically their God, God of free will. But it says he would not let the people go. So then the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, and will hold them still, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle. Now we're talking about economic sanction. Upon thy cattle which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, upon the sheep, there shall be a very grievous moraine, some sort of disease that attacks these sorts of cattle. Well, here again, God is attacking one of their gods. This one happened to be of goddess called Hathor, H-A-T-H-O-R, and this goddess, just like the god that had the head of a fly, this goddess had the head of a cow. And we look at that and think, how on earth? But this is what happens when men are left to their own depravity. They'll worship anything. Just like Paul wrote about in Romans chapter 1, they, they worship the creature rather than the creator. They turn the glory of God into licentiousness. That's why today even, they don't talk about God directing the wind, they say Mother Nature. Isn't it interesting they use Mother Nature? There's a goddess. That they believe somehow is it directing the wind and the rain and the storm and all that. That's a, that's a blasphemy in the face of God himself. Can you imagine a weatherman today or a woman that Every time they gave a weather report, and said, well, now God's hand is directing the wind this way. We don't know how he will direct it, but we are predicting a severe storm and likely to be many dead that God has purposed. How long do you think such a weather person would keep their job? They'd probably be fired. People would be angry. No, God wouldn't do that. Maybe not your God. Here was God attacking this God of the livestock, basically. But they put their the goddess of the livestock. So the Lord, it says, shall sever between the cattle of Israel and cattle of Egypt. The same condemnation is not going to be upon the Lord's people as upon the world. He makes a difference in his grace and mercy. That's what we see here. That there shall nothing die of all that is the children of Israel's such is the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ. And the Lord appointed, there it is again, it's not just happening, appointed a set time saying, tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. The Lord shall do this. Here's that weather person. That's what the Lord's going to do tomorrow. He's going to send a hurricane, and he's going to destroy 100,000 people tomorrow. Stand by and wait. That's the God of this world, whether men will have him or not. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow. 
And all the cattle of Egypt died. All the cattle of Egypt died. But the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. There's a picture of how God, through Christ, is going to have every one for whom he paid the debt. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. And you think, okay, this really is going to turn his heart. Nope. The heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. People will hang on to their profession with a death grip. Even though clearly there's no salvation apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, they will go to their death hanging on to their God. Rigor mortis sets in, and they cannot let it go. That's what we see here with Pharaoh. And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. Here again is another goddess that they worship. Interestingly, it's the name Isis, I-S-I-S, -S, that you hear about today, but a different, it's still that name. And here it has to do with an organization, but they're still god -hears. And uh, this Egyptian goddess was the goddess of medicine and peace. They would typically take ashes and use it for medicine medicinal purpose. I think there's even some naturalists today that think that somehow if you take ashes and apply it here, apply it there, that it's going to provide you some healing. Well, this was just the opposite. These ashes turned to boils and sores. Imagine that. It shall become small dust in the land of Egypt and shall be a boil breaking forth with plains upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. They took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh. This was, these were the furnaces that were used as brick kilns for the, the children of Israel to make bricks. And here Moses takes and sprinkles it up toward heaven. And it became a boil breaking forth with plains upon man and upon beast. Notice it says, and the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the oil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. The Lord, notice here, hardened the heart of Pharaoh. All up to now it says Pharaoh hardened his heart, but behind it was the Lord hardening his heart. All God has to do to harden a sinner's heart is lead them to themselves. And they shall be hardened, and nothing can change them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me, for I will at this time send all my plagues, notice, upon thine heart. So God here, he's not trying something and then that didn't work, so he's trying something else. He's purposing all along through these plagues the hardening of the heart of these that as they continued to trust in their gods, they would never repent. I'll tell you, it's the same thing with the false gospel being preached today by so many, that somehow God is at man's whim. And if they'll just cry enough, if they'll just serve him enough, then God will hear him. No, that's a hard one. But he's doing all of this, he says in verse 14, I will at this time send all my plagues upon thy heart, upon thy servants, and upon thy people that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. People today that say they know God, they don't know him. But when we read the scripture, we find out about him. This is why many preachers don't want to preach this, because it gets people upset. Imagine talking about being upset, talk about asking the Egyptians how I felt. For now, I will stretch out my hand that I might I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. In other words, this is a pestilence unto death. And all of this by the Lord's turning ashes, which is a picture of death, isn't it? And causing it then to have its full effect in the hearts and minds of the people. And in very deed, verse 16, for this cause have I raised thee up, does this sound familiar?
to you from Romans chapter 9, why did God raise up Pharaoh? For in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. People can argue, raise their fists in the face of God, such as our nature, to say what kind of God would raise people up just to destroy them. Sovereign, holy, just God does that. If you have a fight with that, you have a fight with God. Whoever your little peanut God is, you might as well go out there and grab a God that has a cow's head or grab a God that has a fly's head. And so many do. They think all oh, everything's just evolving. No, it's not. I mean, something about evolution is, is the most unbelievable teaching that, uh, that you could ever imagine. There's nothing scientific about it. There's nothing in science that proves it in any way. You say, well, why do so many people believe in and teach it? It's because they will not have God to reign over them. They don't like that very first word in Genesis, in the beginning, God created them. He's created vessels of mercy. And if we are one, all the grace and glory and honor belong to him. But he's also created vessels of wrath, such as God. That's what we read here. He didn't raise up Pharaoh to try to get him to be converted. No, he raised him up for one purpose, that he might reveal in his destruction his very power. It says in verse 17, As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people. Is God just in condemning sinners? Yes, every one of us exalts ourselves before him, except it be for the grace of God. That thou wilt not let them go. Behold, tomorrow, about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. So here we come again to another goddess. I find it interesting. These are Egyptian words. They sound funny in English, but this goddess is named Nut. N-U-T. You can probably pronounce it Nut, something like that. But this is a goddess of hail. They really believed in a goddess of hail. And yet, we see here with the goddess of the sky. But what's interesting that shows again, this is God and not a God of man's making, because this is as hail rained down in the form of fire. Fire and ice. You say, how does that go together? Well, the Lord so purposed it here. He said, Behold, tomorrow, verse 18, about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. That is, that there's no way that any glory can be given to any other goddess or god, that men may know that this is the God who ordains all things. He's the God of creation, he's the God of providence, he's the God of salvation. And he is the God of condemnation. Anything that takes place, it's going to be to his glory. Send therefore now, verse 19, gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. Notice that salvation, life is in the hand of God, to give life to whom he will and to take life. Blessed be the name of the Lord. People today think that death comes because somehow it got the other end. No, God ordains both. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. They're thinking this time, we're not going to leave these cattle out in the field. I find it interesting too, if all the cattle died that were in Egypt, where did these Egyptians now get their cattle. They must have had to have negotiated those cattle from the Israelites, which would have been another humiliation. But now that they had them, it says, He that regarded not the word of the Lord. You say, Wow, how could you live through this and not regard the word of the Lord? Well, such is the hardness of the heart. I've often mentioned to you, people like cattle, they chew it away on the, on the grass and up pulls the butcher truck. They all look up, watch as they take away a few cattle, and then what do they do? Go right back down to That's what we see here. These are regarded not. Left his servants and his cattle in the field, and the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven. 
Again, nothing happens but what God's mediator declares it. Here's a picture of Christ where he prayed even in the garden. He thanked God that the God the Father had given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. In all of these plagues, we don't hear of one possession of the Israelites or even one of the Israelites falling prey to that. That shows the Lord is directing even in who, when, where, and how. It says, the Lord said unto Moses, stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man, upon beast, and upon every herb in the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail. And notice, the fire ran along upon the ground. You say, well, that was the effect of the, the lightning. Well, it's still the Lord directing it. The Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt, so there was hail and fire mingled with the hail. Who could do that but God? It's either cold or hot. No, it's both. Very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail smoked throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smoked every herb of the field and brake every tree of the field. There's nothing that happens by chance. It's according to the Lord's direction in every detail. Only in the land of Goshen, notice again, where the children of Israel were, there was there no hail. The Lord caused it to rain on the just and the unjust, but in his judgments, he's always going to protect his people. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. It shows again that some can even, it doesn't say I'm a sinner. So I've sinned. Again, negotiating with the Lord. The Lord is righteous. How much can people say that seems to be right as it comes through their lips, and yet their heart is hardened still? He says, I, my people, are wicked. I know a bunch of evangelists today that would have jumped on that, so call it that. and said, ah, there it is. Come forward, make your decision. Treat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know, again, how that the earth is the Lord's. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye will not yet fear the Lord God. Moses wasn't fooled, neither is God not fooled by men's words. The flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax was bold. But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. So the Lord preserved, even in his mercy, a portion by which they would continue to live. And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread abroad his hands and the, on the Lord and the thunders, and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured upon the earth. Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased. Notice, he sinned yet more. You're not going to restrain this heart of rebellion unless the Lord grants repentance. It hardened his heart, he and his servants. The heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Well, we made it pretty far, didn't we? Chapter 10. <laughs> Just enough to whet our appetite. You can read on ahead if you want, but I'm not going to rush through it. Lord willing, we'll continue to see how the Lord brought his wrath down upon another one of their gods. This one was called Seth. And he was a god of storms and disorder. But here's where the Lord plagued them with locusts from the sky. Karen and I can kind of smile because we actually had some locusts when we were growing up in Africa as young kids, and I'm telling you, you don't want to go through it. You just sit and watch this dark cloud come through and just demolish and eat everything, strips everything in its way. And the noise, the sound, it's, it's frightening. And it got up into our clothes, and we had to run inside to escape. But here, there was no escape. We're going to read about that later in chapter 10. And then there's one other God, 
the sovereign God attacked, that's Ra, sun god. And God brought three days of complete darkness. I find that interesting that in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, he brought darkness for three hours on the face of the earth. That was a time when he was dealing with the sin of his people and the person of his son. And that communion that was between the Father and the Son. But it shows that God is God. And then the ultimate power that we're going to read about, study next time, is the death of the firstborn. Lots of lessons to see in there. So we won't rush it. We didn't get a good way through. And I pray the Lord bless us and this God who needs to teach us. Let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 256. We're going to partake of the Lord's table. 256. Let's stand and sing this. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attended my way, Sorrows like sea billows pour. Whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well. With my soul, it is well, it is well, with my soul. Though Satan should buff me, no trial should come, let this last assurance
portion of Mark 14 that we're about here is what our Lord instituted as to how we should remember his body, which was represented here in the unleavened bread, the body that was prepared for him, that with it he should work out the perfect salvation of his people and then the blood for both, the body and the blood. There's a lot of times we can get caught up above with the events of the Last Supper and forget it's not about the what but the who. And uh, I would encourage us by God's grace to consider the who. That's why we're here. The Lord separated out certain ones or at least one that was there about the Passover table. This was the final Passover that the Lord had eaten. Yet he said in verse 20 of Mark 14, it is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. Is that sop of which they ate the old Passover. And he said, the Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him. It was for this that Christ came to pay the sin debt written of him. He said, woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. So he was clearly signaling out here Judas Iscariot. Good word for that man if he had never been born. So here's a man who had seen Christ with his eyes, walked with him, slept by him, ate with him, and yet was not the Lord's. And he partook of that old Passover. I truly believe as you read the, in the John's edition or the way the Spirit directed John to write this, at this point, the Lord said to him, whatever thou doest, do quickly. And he got up and left. He went to betray Christ to the Pharisees. The disciples, of course, didn't know what it was. They esteemed that he was going out to pay alms to the poor because he was the treasurer. Now with his disciples around him at this table, that's where we read in verse 22, that they did eat. This is the New Testament now, not the old Passover, the new. Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. So that's the bread that we hold in our hand. Now when he says, take, eat, this is my body, there's some that would superstitiously believe that by some incantation of some priest, that this actually becomes Christ's body. And that's why they make people come up front and they'll take and place this right on the tongue of each person to make sure that no part ever falls on the ground because God forbid a piece of Christ's body should fall on the ground. Aren't you thankful that that's not what this is? When Christ said, this is my body. He's, it's like a picture. You want a picture of who I am as God in the flesh, as the God-man, this right here depicts everything. Just like wheat was sown in the ground and raised up and was cut down and put in a mill and ground and, and then put in the fire, roasted the fire. That's all a picture of Christ, the bread of life. That's who we're celebrating here. It's Christ in his person and then also in his work, this cup representing his blood. Don't think that because Judas went his way that the disciples were any more deserving. It's not for the worthy. We don't partake because we think ourselves worthy. Again, Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. And if anybody for a minute thought that somehow those remaining 11 around that table, that they somehow were better than Judas, you just have to read after Christ had sung a hymn and they went out the Mount of Olives, Verse 27 of Mark 14 says, Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, he said, I will go before you into Galilee. Of course, Peter denied that that was his denial. No, Lord, that's not going to happen to me. Well, before the cock crowed, he had denied him three times. Let's not think that our partaking is because of any worthiness in us. All of the worthiness is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he took the bread, 
Thus he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. That's who this is for, it's for those for whom he came and paid the debt. He said unto them, This is my new, this is my blood of the New Testament, not of the old, under the laws of the Old Testament. He fulfilled, he would fulfill all of that, but the new. And he says it's shed for many. Actually, in the original it's the many. And of the many sinners that God in his electing grace purpose, the Son should save by his death and has saved. He said, Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. What was that day? What was the day of his resurrection? When he went by those 40 days that he spent going and revealing himself unto those for whom he paid them, wasn't everybody? And he ate and drank with them. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the mount of olives. And it's like the Lord with the bread and the cup. Gracious Father, I thank you that you left us such a simple declaration of your person and your work. The unleavened bread and body that was prepared without sin, and yet in the cup is shed blood, both require that perfect obedience that you might be a just God to save you. Oh, may we not take it lightly. May we, in partaking, Lord, see all the worthiness of Christ nothing in ourselves. May our eyes be upon him and all the glory belong to him and him alone. And for that we give you praise, honor, and glory in his precious name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 488. 488, we stand and sing this, my Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me on the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free sing oh sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my heart the dead have made me free. I will tell a wondrous story how my wrongs this day to save. In his boundless love and mercy, he the ransom freely gave. Sing, oh, sing. Thank you. 